Right, Project NASA. Um, joining me is Jolene Bantin. Um, well, a former councillor, a political activist, um, in a bit of a hot water at the moment. Uh, we spoke about her briefly on the last show with uh, with Nick, and um, she's here now to join us. So uh, welcome, Jolene. Thanks very much for taking the time to, to come on Project Now. Thank you ha for having me on, David. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, just if you don't mind, just um, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how you got involved in politics and, and, and where you are today. No problem. I am Jolene Bunting. I was elected to Belfast City Council in 2014. I was founded out of my position um, by the globalist cabal that seemed to uh, to hound everyone who speaks up for British people out of office. So I am... Um, I'm a mother first and foremost. I'm a Christian and I absolutely have um, traditional fa family values and I believe that this nation is in very, very dark times. Um, and I know, David, you share that view. Yeah, it's, um, it's yeah, shocking what's going on, isn't it, really? But um, yeah. <laughs> so what got what got you involved in politics in the first place? I, I mean, I know I know Northern Ireland's you know very political. Um, you know, I've had um Frank Pornari on on the show. He, he used to um he was a former gun runner for the UDA. Um, so we've touched on this show previously about Northern Ireland, but just for you know viewers who aren't quite aware of Northern Ireland, I mean, how how did you get involved with politics and you know, well, Northern Ireland is very political. Um, from a young age, I have always known about our green and orange politics. Um, and I love my country. I, I wanted to join the army and I never did. And when the opportunity to came up to stand for local government, I thought, you know, this is my chance to, to fight for my country through my tongue rather than through war. So um, it was, it was, a privilege to stand and I stood for a small party and um, they only have one MLA they ha have I think there's nine councillors now um there was 13 elected with me um called traditional unionist voice and they are all about being traditional and maintaining our British way of life um and I stood for the for the TUV and um, I was elected and it was quite a surprise that I was elected because it was my first time running. It doesn't usually happen. So it was a yeah. surprise that I was elected. Um, and I absolutely loved being a council. I loved dealing with constituents and um, I loved uh, being able, being, being able to speak about things and people to pay attention because, you know, I've lost my, my title now and the mainstream media just ignore anything I have to say as they do with anyone who's pointing out the truth. So how long was your counsellor for and what was it like? Well, I actually, I, ha I had a, a head start with the council because uh, there was government reforms and I got an extra year. So I was actually elected for five years, even though most terms are only four. Um, so I, I had a, a year to kind of find the feet as such. Um, and I was in there and it was absolutely fantastic um, to, uh, as I said, highlight the things that really matter to me, which one just happens to be terrorism. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I got into politics in the first place. Here in Northern Ireland, we have terrorists in government. So basically, to stop the IRA killing innocent civilians, the government said, we will give you a place in our government as of right. Um, and you can, you know, govern the country instead of blowing it to pieces. And obviously the IRA took that and now they are sitting in the head of our government and it disgusts me. And, you know, when I look on the mainland and I see Islamic terrorism, it terrifies me to think that the British government might do a similar deal with, it, with, with Islamic terrorists. Can you imagine if ISIS were put into Westminster? I don't think the British people would be sitting on their backsides for too long then. But it is happening. 
in a part of the UK. Um, and it's something I feel passionate about that anyone who is convicted of murder should never be allowed to own a, a, a title such as a member of local government, a member of local parliament, or a, a, a member of parliament who doesn't take their seat which is exactly what we have here in Northern Ireland. Our MPs uh, don't even take their seat. I'm in West Belfast. I have Sinn Féin MP, and he refuses to take his seat at, at Westminster. However, he still gets his way, and that's wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Um, and it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, so, obviously, I wanted to speak out against the Islamic terrorism, and I wanted to stand in solidarity with um with my brothers and sisters on the mainland who were going through this we have gone through it for 40 years we know the the, the pressure that is put on the community when terrorism hits and when i spoke out about islamic terrorism that's when the real trouble started right and... so we we were just discussing this just before we we started recording so um yeah to... <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what happened. You, 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 um, you criticised the religion that can't be criticised. And um, what happened? <laughs> All hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. It was the mainstream media were coming at me. Every other political party were coming at me, bar maybe two um, unionist parties who didn't come at me, but they didn't stand in support of me. Um, I, I was obviously speaking about the mass immigration, mass uncontrolled immigration into the UK. I was speaking about the terrorism that comes with Islam and why that comes with, with this religion. Um, and people did not like it. So they managed to get me suspended. They silenced me on no, numerous occasions in the chamber. And then they managed to get me suspended by complaining to the local government commissioner. Now, this is my political opponents complaining to the commissioner. Um, and, and that is what got me suspended without investigation. So I was suspended from the council for, it, it worked out around about three months. And I appealed their decision to suspend me without investigation. Um, but the high, high court, didn't, didn't know what their powers were um, and basically I was left in limbo um, the month before the election I was suspended again to serve out my suspension um, and two weeks before the election my social media was completely taken down and, yeah, yeah I know about that one <laughs> so you you won't be surprised David to know that I didn't win my seat um, that I didn't lose a furley um, which frustrates me because if I lost it fairly, I would say hands up, I lost my seat. But I did not have fair chance in that election, thanks to the cabal that is the globalism. And the same people every time are the same people who are attacking us. Yeah, uh, this is this is see this is across the board. You're everybody, you know, if you speak out, you you, you get deleted. And I I used to have a Facebook page. I'm I'm completely banned from Facebook now. By the way, so if I start a new page on, or start a new profile on, on Facebook, as soon as I add my friends, it knows it's me. Um, and then I, I get told suspicious activity and the account's blocked straight away. Uh, before that, I was uh, I had an account called the Brexiteers. And it was just whilst the, um, you know, the Brexit referendum was going ahead and stuff. And we had about 90 thousand followers and reaching between two and three million people um, a day sometimes, you know, with the reposts and stuff. and um, I kept getting banned. No reason. Um, no, they weren't saying why. Seven day ban, and eventually it was thirty day bans, and then, and, and eventually my everything was gone. My my pro my private profile, uh, videos from where I've been traveling were all gone, um, without any explanation. Um, my le oh, my and latest profile, um, my latest profile, they just locked me out and keep saying that the password's wrong and I can't I can't yeah. change the password. <laughs> and I'm like, I know that you've realized it's me, yeah. but you know, do you have to do you have to lock yeah. me out of it? You know, it always, you can't it always seems to happen as well. Whenever whenever there was a, an election coming ahead, whether it be local elections or a general election, um, you know, that's when you get the big ban. So you, you can't say anything before the election or just after the election they 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 tuck you up. Um okay. yeah, not good. So so yeah, so you, you got you got suspended. Um and that was 
as we said before, it's around about what, 2019. So where where did this what well, what happened with this with the Britain First thing as well? Because I remember seeing that in the papers. Um they were described well, if I remember rightly, it was described as a Britain First councillor, if I remember rightly. Is that is that right? Or am I wrong? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it was just fake news, fake news as always. I never actually joined Britain First, but I did work closely with Jada and, and her team and it was it was an experience to say the least but I mean that again was I had an anti-terrorism rally in Belfast City Centre and Jada, um, Paul Rimmer, um, Banksy and uh, Paul Bowling all spoke there as well as myself. All of all four of them were actually arrested. I wasn't arrested for my speech, but all four of them were arrested. And Jada actually got um, a conviction over that. She had to do community service for for um, speaking out against Islam. Um, so when she was arrested, that kind of drew me into Britain first, and that's when I started working with them. Um, and I actually went over to to I think it was Folkestone. Um, where the court case took place where they were actually imprisoned for uh, Jada got six months and I think Paul got like three months um mm. but they were they were in prison and I remember sitting in the court shocked at the judge because the the, the evidence pointed to these people are walking free they should be classed as heroes because they confronted these pedophiles mm. and the judge just said in my opinion and you know well I'm going through the, a court case at the minute, as you know, and it terrifies me to think that a judge has so much control over the law. You don't have to break the law. It just needs to be um, a case that the judge doesn't really like you, so, so yeah. they can lock you up. Um, and so, yeah, I worked closely with Britain first for, for quite a while, but then, as usual, well, what happened was... Paul Golding was actually beating Jada um, and she told me this and I told her to get out. I told her to get a, what any friend would in a domestic violence relationship. Um, I told her she had to get out of this relationship um, and when she did things turned nasty with Paul unfortunately um, and and the rest of the history is the same. <laughs> I think I see. I think I remember seeing a documentary uh, with you two on it um, a while back about that, if, if I remember rightly. Um, yeah, I'm not too. I don't really follow Britain First. I'm not you know, I'm not a big fan of you know. Um, yeah, but I'm, yeah, I'm not, not got anything against them. But yeah, I don't um, don't don't follow them. I've never kept up with what they get up to. I did see a few of their videos uh, with Paul and Jaylee, you know, doing the flyer and stuff and. Um, saw what you were just talking about the conviction and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I didn't really. Yeah, not 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 um, putting it politely. Yeah, I, not, not a big fan. <laughs> I think you know. I think um, everyone is just looking for a leader, and I, I think anyone yeah. who thinks us, we're just looking for a leader, and and that causes things like you know getting involved with. Britain first, and then you know getting your fingers burnt. Um, and there are so many articulate smart young uh, young guys out there who are doing a great job who mm. aren't stepping forward or they're getting involved in traps where they are then you know humiliated really um for for being associated with certain people and it's it's not it's not a good situation to be on the right because we don't have an an actual leader um uh, we we want one, we want someone who is going to stand up and articulate our views uh, without being humiliated. And, and a lot of the time, while the left are trying to humiliate us, it, it's completely unjustified. However, I know from my experience that it's the left's point of view that people are seeing. And it, it discredits you then within the wider community, even though it's lies. But, you know, it, it goes, Someone has said to me, if you're explaining, you're losing. And that's the reality of it. Unfortunately, we are being lied to. And when you when you are trying to explain that this is lies, people are just not interested. They're interested in the juicy news and that's it. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. You know, and like I said about Britain First, I don't got anything against them. I just, you know, not, not my cup of tea. You know, you know, I've met I met Paul at a few rallies, not like on a on a personal level, but I know some friends who joined um 
were in first and it was well I think they I don't know if they joined but they would they donated money. They had a problem with donating uh money and they instead of them taking one donation, apparently they kept taking the same donation over and over again. Um <laughs> look at their bank accounts and there's money going out. Um so <laughs> I was like, well, you know, that's you know, I don't want to be involved with all that. But you're right. I mean, in the sense, there is no um, political leader. And that's what what bothers me, and at the same time, kind of scares me as well, Jody, because I'm not I'm not a far right type of person. You know, I'm not like extreme. I'm, I, I consider myself more cent more centre right. But the issue I have is politics has shifted so far left over the last couple of decades that anyone who's seen as centre is now seen as far right. And you know, people, you know, as you as you just mentioned there, you, you can't speak out, you get shut down. And um my my fear is that eventually a leader will step up, but they there will be extreme far right. And the people will be like, Well, you know, I'm getting called far right anyway. Um and then never it'll be someone who's extreme may get elected. Um that's my fear of um what might happen as 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 the course of what I think there's a lot of people I think there is a lot of people who think the same way as you, David. And, you know, um, I am probably further right than most people. Um, however, what I will say is that demonizing people who have kind of taken that too far right approach is 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 losing us battles big time mm. because I have seen so many leader real, you know people grabbers, people who are articulate and people who genuinely have the the country's well-being at heart, you know, mm. um, I, and I have seen these people being demonised um, for maybe being members of the BNP. Yeah, we'll have to remember the BNP was a, a legitimate political party who had many councillors. Um, we are losing those people because they, they're seen as too far right because of mistakes of other people within that party. Um, and I think it's something that we as, as a movement have to deal with, you know, and not demonize everyone just mm. because they have maybe gone along with that, that narrative for a while. You know, as I say, I, I would agree with nine out of 10 of, in fact, I probably would agree with all of BMP's policies. They were a legitimate political party, but there was idiots who, express views that just weren't popular the, the, the people just don't want to hear people expressing those kind of views and they should have no, known better um if they want to be in politics um but that shouldn't mean that everyone who is a member of that party is tarred with that same brush yeah i think um we we discussed that a few few friends of mine and some some political leaders as well we've discussed that um in recent weeks actually um because we were saying for example i used to be a member of ukip you know and it was merely because of, of brexit um but one of the policies they had was you couldn't join if you'd been a member of um english defense league um british national party etc um and i think there were a few people but it was a case by case basis you know obviously as you were saying they're idiots you know but you, you know if you can uh, assess or at least do some sort of um screening and vetting on a person um then yeah what why not um allow them to, to to enter the party sort of thing but um yeah i agree with you on that 100 percent um not everybody i think some people just joined literally because they were concerned you know yeah, um, i i think you know i think what the policy needs to be changed to is no idiots in the party that mm. would be oh and that that I, I wish you know the conservatives would, would do the same and um i don't think we would have a prime minister again um but the, the reality is, you know, people do stupid things. And I, I do think that sometimes, uh, you know, um, people demonise them for, for no reason. And I think that's a major loss to the movement. Well, I've, I checked out some of your videos actually earlier before we had a chat. Um, and I wanted to have a look at, um, so I checked out your, your YouTube. And I see there's a few videos on there. Uh, one in particular I quite liked was you called in a, a local hotel um, that was um, booked out by the Home Office um, for economic migrants. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. David, we all have heard the <laughs> stories um, of these 
migrants coming here and getting their free hotels. They are now complaining about it in Northern Ireland. It's not oh, good enough for them. Um, so yeah, I did go to one hotel um and I I I spoke to some of the the people who were there, um, which opened my eyes to say, you know, these people are dangerous for our society. Um and we the, the locals had actually called the protest. So I, I had gone to the hotel after they had called the protest and I I uh, came along to the protest. Um and I had an absolute influx of different hotels that I could go and visit and have the exact same experience. And I thought to myself, I actually w went to a few and got some footage. And then I thought to myself, I could be doing this for the all day, every day, if yeah. I, I wanted to, to, to do it. Um, it's an absolute disgrace. These people are entering our country illegally. And they're being treated like kings and queens. Mm. You know, the, there's elderly people. I see elderly people day in and day out who can't move, but are still having to go to get their own shopping. They're still have, a, you know, we, we hear that they're going to freeze this summer or this winter. Um, and um, what do we get? You know, um, we'll, we'll give you £400 on your electric. Well, you know, that's really not good enough mm. considering it's costing more than 400 pound a day for one of these economic migrants to stay in this hotel um i don't to be honest with you david i don't believe that the the state do you um owe any of us um anything and we, we need to make sure that we get through this winter by community and i know that you are going to struggle with that especially in england because you don't no longer have a good strong British community um oh, yeah. I do I'm really lucky that I live in an area where there are going to be community activists you know who are going to be at hand if anyone is struggling however there's elderly people who I know in England Scotland Wales and in Northern Ireland and in more rural areas and places that don't have such a great community um that are going to be alone at home and be too afraid to turn their their heating on and um and I feel for them while we're feeding these people who were born in different countries who have paid their taxes to different countries in some cases have fought for different countries um uh, against the British people yeah. and are are now coming to our shores illegally and being treated like kings and queens kings um I was about to say queens but there is no women um yeah you know, this, that's this, the reality of yeah it. no you're right there see I'm in the security industry and a friend of mine um I won't name him but he he works um in the hotels in London where the migrants are and he's um well he, he got into a fight with, with a few migrants. He's moved a couple of hotels and stuff. But he was saying um you know he's on a floor. Um, one of the floors he was situated on was a floor for just women and children. Um, the rest of the hotel was taken up by the rest of the economic migrants. But one floor was reserved for females and and uh, women. But he um and children. But he was on that floor because of the sexual harassment, um which led him into a few fights, um with with them. So you know. We, we exactly as you were just saying there, you know, we're putting people up in these four star hotels that haven't contributed to this country whatsoever. And then we've got, you know, British families and, you know, and not to mention British veterans that have served this country. It's estimated there are between six and seven thousand British veterans that sleep rough on our streets. Um, meanwhile, um, we've got all these illegal economic migrants being part of four star hotels. I think the government have just proved they could end homelessness if they really wanted to, couldn't they? Yeah. yeah, absolutely, David. I uh, I was in England once, and we were going out for a night. Um, we were walking down the street, and I couldn't believe. In Northern Ireland, we we haven't been too too bad with with immigration. We we have kind of quite uh, still quite a white population. Um, and you don't really see ethnic minorities, you know, especially like in the city centre and things like that. Um they're few and far between I was terrified when I went to London and I seen how many migrants were there um and I understand they're just normal people but what I couldn't believe was we, we were walking down a street and there was kind of an alleyway and we stopped to talk to a homeless man well actually um he got up to ask us we would have a cigarette and he heard my Belfast accent and he said oh I served in Belfast 
And I was like, right, okay. I give the man a cigarette and got chatting to him. And his mate came over. And his mate um, said, oh, you're from Belfast. I served in Belfast too. And I thought to myself, these are two veterans lying on the street while I'm walking past. And, and I mean, there was no, you know, Native Britain, the British people there. It was just a sea uh, of foreign uh, foreign immigrants walking to go on a night out while these, the only white men in the street were lying on the ground. And I just couldn't believe this. And I, I don't say that because of the colour of their skin. I wouldn't care what the colour of the skin was, but that stood out more. Um, and this this guy came out, he said, you know, you're from Belfast, I served there. And I looked at my partner and I give these in cigarettes and chatted to them. And I looked across the street and I remember I seen the guy in the distance and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do if I go over to this man. And he's a veteran too. And I walked over and lo and behold, he heard my Belfast accent, said he served in Northern Ireland. And at that point, David, I just broke down in tears. I just started to cry. I couldn't believe what a state we had allowed our once mm. great nation to become. You know, I was absolutely devastated. Um, and I, I we, we ended up, we got a taxi back to the hotel because... I, I had got so upset and, um, you know, everyone kind of was like, what is wrong? And I was like, can you not see what is going on yeah. here? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's disgusting, from, yeah. It's dis sorry, sorry to stop you. I've got, we've, got like, we've got like two minutes left on this. So I just want to, before we go, um, I know you can't talk about your court case. Um, that's, you know, you, you've got, you've got um, but so what was there? Want I just want to talk about the, your, there was a memorial, um, Charlie Hutchins, um, you spoke at that. Um, tell us a little bit about that, if you can. We, we've got a couple of minutes. Right, well, well, I mean, we have... Was that Charlie Hutchins? Dennis Hutchins? Dennis Hutchins, sorry. My bad, yeah. I've had a couple of years. I've been, I've been, I've been. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Hutchins, yes. sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically in our country, it's not good enough to have the IRA in government. We also have soldiers being convicted for um, for for uh, killings during the trouble during the troubles, which were um, in the nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties. Um, now most of these soldiers are now elderly gentlemen, and they are determined to fight for justice and to prove themselves innocent. However, what we have is the government who is forcing this um, agenda on. To, to our veterans who are being prosecuted. Um, we have tried to get it through Parliament um, that, that this won't go ahead. However, while the British government are um, willing to, to protect our now serving vets, they aren't prepared to protect our vets who protected us um, in, in the past. And still now we, we see um, veterans being hauled to court in their their elderly years um to to be made criminals um and we all know what the justice system is like we all know how um cruel it can be um how long it can go on and i was at court many times with dennis hutchings uh, waiting on the 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 court to make a decision on it um and they never did unfortunately dennis passed away before they they bothered to clear that man's name um and 